John chapter 11, if you would, please. Good to be in God's house tonight. Again, you pray for us. We're going to head out tomorrow and be headed to Wichita, Kansas. It is uh, going to be held at a Christian school, pretty good sized Christian school from what I can see on Google, Google Maps. And um, so there's plenty of room for us to park that big old bus that we've got. And um, uh, hopefully by the time we come back, all the flooring will be done in our house. Yeah, amen. I'm going to start calling people and say, hey, can you help us put everything back? This, of course, is about Lazarus and uh, him dying. We were looking at the stone cut without hands, the stone, the rock of Christ. Christ is the chief cornerstone. Is, um, when people stoned to death as a result of some transgression of the law, that that stoning to death, why did God pick? I don't know what's going on. Is it like cutting in and out? Um, maybe move that receiver closer to that window if you can. Uh, but anyway, um, where was I at? Yeah, I, I believe that God instituted the punishment of stoning as a foreshadow of, in Daniel chapter 2 in the fourth kingdom, the stone that is cut without hands goes and falls on the ten toes and the whole thing comes crushing, you know, falling down and it falls then on the stone and is ground into dust like the chaff in the summer threshing floor and blown away of the wind. They're not going to be around anymore. And uh, Jesus said that, uh, you know, I am that stone. If anybody will fall on me and be broken, you know, I'll heal him. But woe to him upon whom this stone falls and crushes and grinds to powder. So I think whenever they stoned somebody in the Bible as a result of a transgression they did, that that is pointing you to the future day when Christ is going to come as that rock, as that stone, and he's going to destroy all the kingdom of the Antichrist in the last days. And so anyway, he is all of those stones put together. I believe... Christ represented the stone that David slung and went right into where the mark of the beast goes. And if you look in Revelation, that was Sam, or Goliath had a deadly wound in his head. Well, so does the beast. He has a deadly wound in one of his heads, but his wound is, is going to be healed. And so um, throughout the Bible, we were just looking at different places of resurrection Let's look at, let's pick it up in John chapter 11, in verse 41. Then they took away the stone from which, from the place where the dead was laid. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. That's the voice of the Lord, the word of God. What did David say in Psalm 119? Quicken me thou according to thy word. Quicken means to be made alive again. And when he had thus spoken, uh, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth. Again, I say it's, I believe it's generic that way. So as to we understand this, this is not just limited to Lazarus. This works for every single one of us. It's not, and I want you to, I want you to understand how this fits in with the doctrine of salvation. Did you choose salvation first 
Or did God call you to salvation? And you responded. Which came first? The chicken or the egg? <laughs> the saved or the savior? Which came first? Which comes first? Faith or the preaching of the word? Huh? Preaching of the word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How can they hear without a preacher? Okay? How can, he, how can the preacher go unless he's been sent? So it starts out with God. God chooses the ones that he's going to resurrect because he knows they will respond to it. He knows the outcome of their life. And so um, this thing right here, we're going to see later on in the text in John 11, that as of this point, the leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all of the elders of the people of Israel at this point said, this man has got to die. Now, think of how stupid that plan's going to be. Here is a man who has so much power that a four-day-old rotted carcass is come back to life simply at the hearing of his words. How are you going to kill a man like that? Right? And if you kill him, he's just going to get up and walk it off. Right? He'll get better. And that's what happened. So, um, he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was... Uh, bound about with a napkin, Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. By the way, I, let me just throw this in here. People have asked me over the, and I've always been fascinated. First time I ever heard of the Shroud of Turin was when I was in, I think it was about junior high school, something like that. It was in the late 70s that uh, the, the church only brings that shroud out every so many years. I don't remember how many years it is, but they don't, they don't just have it out all the time. But every so often... That Catholic church in um, Turin, Italy, which is holding on to the shroud, they will have like a, a shroud festival. And when it goes on display, literally people from all over the world will, will travel to Turin, Italy, just to get a glimpse of this new idol that they have. And they treat it like an idol. They pray to it. They want, to, they want to touch the glass that it's in. They, want to, they, they think that if they touch that, then God's virtue will be passed upon them and they can receive forgiveness of sins. That's the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church loves its relics. Anything that belonged to some dead person who was famous in the Catholic Church, they, boy, they latch on to that. If you kiss this relic, or you kiss the table that this relic is sitting on, then God gives you a special grace in your life for a while. And you can, you've got at least 30 sins to commit before you run out of that grace. It's, it's that way, all right? It's crazy stuff. What did Jesus say? You're full of dead men's bones, is what he said. And so when it comes to the Shroud of Turin, the way they wrapped Lazarus here is almost identical to the way they wrapped Jesus. Notice that, that he was bound hand and foot with the grave clothes and his face was bound about with a napkin. So there were, with Lazarus, there was two actual cloths. So it was with Jesus. When they wrapped and bound Jesus up and brought in the, the myrrh and the spices and the embalming ointment that they had, uh, to basically, what they were trying to do was mask the smell long enough to get him buried. And uh, when they brought all that uh, to Jesus, and they were going to, you know, minister that to him, and, and so on and so on, uh, it basically, like I said, it was just an enable to, to cover up the smell of Lazarus. Lazarus has already been bound this way, and then the the... the linens that they wrapped Jesus in, 
The Bible's specific. There was one that covered his body and then a separate one that was wrapped around his head. And yet with the Shroud of Turin, it's one long piece of cloth that was laid out. The body was laid on the bottom part and the top was folded over the top of his body and whatever. And I just don't see how an image could be stamped on there that is a perfect... It, it, you couldn't get any better if an artist had done it. An artist. Because if you were to take your face and paint it with wet paint, and then take a cloth and put it over your face, okay? And then after the paint dries a little bit, peel that off. Will you get an image of a face on there? No. Because the cloth is going to go to the contours of your face and it, whatever image on there is going to be distorted when it's, when it's taken back off and, and laid out straight. It's going to be distorted because your face is not two-dimensional. It's not flat. And so I, don't, I just don't see how that could have happened. But anyway, the Bible does say that there were two different claws that covered the body of Jesus. And so the Shroud of Turin basically has his whole body on there Head and everything, but that's not what the scripture said. So I just, I quit believing in it. All right, let me, I've been talking about this idea of resurrection. Um, God is the giver of life. God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. We have um, the, the Shunammite woman's child who died and Elisha, the servant of God, laid down upon him. And I, you know, maybe breathed into him or whatever, but the child sneezed seven times and uh, opened his eyes. Now he's alive again and so on. And then um, turn to Ezekiel chapter 37. We're looking at God bringing dead things back to life. Uh, Chris, let me ask you a question. You know anything about Islam? Okay. Did you know that they have a, a prophet that lived back, oh, probably 17, 1600 years ago, something like that, an imam that they believe is going to return to earth one of these days and set the world astray for Islam. In other words, he is going to establish Islamic rule over the whole earth. Jesus also is going to appear because this imam has, has come back from the dead and Jesus is going to say, listen to this imam. Okay, have you ever heard anything like that? Okay, and when I heard that, because a lot of these religions have the promise that whatever God they had at one point, he's coming back one day, okay? Uh, who knows who Viracocha is? Viracocha was a fair-skinned, bearded, lightly brownish hair, European looking guy, European or Middle Eastern looking guy, um, tall, sort of a giant, that had special powers and he taught them, gave them special technology. He was, he was sort of a, a, like a Messiah figure, like a Christ figure to the people of Central and South America. Okay, Viracocha. Now you have to understand the South American natives, there's one thing that they cannot do very well. Grow a beard. So when they talk about some Messiah that they had years ago named Viracocha that was sort of pale in color and he had fair complexion and fair hair and he had a beard, that's not one of them. But Viracocha left them riding off into the sea and going down into the sea, but he promised that he would come back to them one of these days. 
So you have all of these Christ-like figures all throughout history who keep saying, I'm going to come back, I'm going to come back, I'm going to come back. You have a promise in most religions that some sort of Messiah person is going to come back. What did Jesus say? Many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ. For there should be many Christs in those days. And um, so anyway, the world is looking for this Messiah to come back. In the case of the Muslim 12th Imam, I had it in my mind that he had gone to heaven to be with Allah and his 72 wives and that he was going to descend from heaven and come down to the earth. But I was wrong about that. There's actually a well. Where is it in Iran? I think it is. They say that he went down into the earth. And one of these days, he's going to arise up out of the well. What does that sound like to you? The beast. I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. I'm going, okay, I know who he is now. Okay. Right, look at Ezekiel 37. And, you know, with all these false messiahs, then we do have in Revelation the beast that was and is not yet is, he has a deadly wound in one of his heads as it were unto death, but the deadly wound was healed. In other words, he's brought back to life again. So in Ezekiel chapter 37, here's another story of resurrection, and I want you to look at how it's done. Then the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them round about and behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. Now, think about this. The Shunammite woman's son had only been dead a short while. And yet God gave Elisha the power to bring him back from the dead. Lazarus had been dead four days, which, in my opinion, you couldn't, you couldn't even pull off like a Frankenstein with somebody been dead four days. The tissue just doesn't adhere very well. It, it start, he literally is starting to break apart. In this case here, these bodies are so dead that they don't even stink anymore. There's nothing to stink. All they are is just dry bones in a big field there. There's no sinew to attach bones together. There's no muscles on the bones. There's no organs. There's no heart, lungs. Nothing, the jawbone eventually comes loose because the stuff that's holding your jawbone on rotted off probably a hundred years ago. So it doesn't matter to God how dead the body is, nor does it matter the condition of the body. I will, um, we had an older couple in this church years ago. And they had one of their adult sons that got real bad sick and he was going to die. And I went over to the hospital to, to visit with them and him. And they were talking about the funeral, what they wanted. And they were talking about, you know, I, I think I might have said, you know, do you know if he signed his donor card? And they said, oh, no. Oh, no. I said, well, okay. I said, well... You know, the hospital is going to come and ask you if you want to donate anything of his in order to benefit somebody that's alive. I personally don't have a problem with it because I'm not using it anymore. You can have it. Okay. Um, John, you can have my back. Okay. Okay. You can have my back. 
Well, that's what he says all the time. He said, Pastor, I got your back. Okay. But the, I, I guess they, and I didn't, really, I didn't really try to correct them. They said, oh, no, oh, no, we don't believe in that. We believe that you leave everything intact so that God has something to resurrect him from. And I didn't, you know, there's a time and a place for everything, and that's not, now, had they asked me, Pastor, what's your opinion on that? Then I would have gone through scripture and told them. The flesh profiteth what? Nothing. Does God need any part of the body to resurrect the dead? No. It's just like the chaff around a seed. When you put the seed in the ground... Once it rains, the rain then starts decaying the chaff layer around the wheat germ, which is where all the DNA is. And once that, once that outer shell of that wheat, that husk of that corn or that shell around that wheat, the husk of the wheat, once it's rotted off completely, then that kernel can grow. So God is clearly showing us, I don't need that. I don't need that. Those who have been burnt up in fires. Those who have been cast out to sea. And possibly their, their remains have been eaten by predators in the ocean. I'm sure that's happened. Can God still resurrect them even though they've been eaten by sharks? Absolutely. He doesn't need anything like that. So here we have the, the dry bones. Verse 2. And he caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. And lo, they were very dry. Which basically is telling you there's not even any marrow left in the bones. It's all just hardened calcium. Uh, and he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, thou knowest. Again, he said unto me, prophesy unto these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and ye shall live. And uh, ye shall know that I am the Lord. Now that's something there that I love that phrase. How many times, and I don't have a number on this, but all through the Old Testament, God's going to say, I'm going to do this, and when I do it, then you shall know that the Lord has been among you. Then you shall know the Lord your God. Then shall you know a prophet has been among you. God was always about, these are the things that I do, I'm going to do, and when I do them, on that day, you're going to know who I am, who, who I've been all along. You're going to know who Jesus really was. That's what he's saying. So, um, verse 7, so I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Now, let's, let's just say, and, and you know, I, I could be, a lot of people could be wrong on this, but I, I see it. Has there ever been a time when a nation was born in a day? No. And yet, the nation of Israel was born pretty much that way. First, it was the Balfour Declaration, which gave the land of the Pal Pal of the land of Palestine. It um, I think the, the British sort of relinquished their claim over it. And then in 1947, after World War II, the Jews petitioned what was to, I guess, the amount, to, what was to amount the United Nations and say, we want, our, we want a homeland back. We, we don't want any more Hitler's Wiping out our people. 
We want a land that we used to have. We want it back. And so the United Nations voted to allow an Israeli state in the land of Palestine. And that's what you have now. And so automatically, Jews from all around the world, Russian Jews, German Jews, New York Jews, although not enough of them, California Jews, Jews from every quarter, even, even Ethiopian Jews were flown up from Ethiopia back in the 90s. And all, if you were a Jewish person, according to the law of the state of Israel, you had automatic citizenship in, in the state of Israel, in the nation of Israel. Um, but there were, there's still Arabs living there, Arab Muslims, they still live there. So what we have here, here's what I see in this. That the bones have come together. God's put sinew and tissue on them. He's joined the bones together. They have, they have their organs. They have their muscles. They have their hair. They have skin over them now. But they're still dead. Israel's still dead. The sodomite capital of the Middle East nations is Tel Aviv, Israel. There are, I would say, probably in the scores of thousands of sodomites, sodomite Jews living in and around the area of Tel Aviv. There are even companies who do, I don't know what you'd call it, sodomite tourism. They promote certain travel packages for you to go to Tel Aviv to be with the other sodomites there, both male and female. And so now, um, verse 8 again says, there was no breath in them. Verse 9, then he said unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came in unto them. They lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. I believe that that would be the 144,000. Do I believe God's going to save all the Jews, every Jew in the last days? No, I don't believe that. I believe he's going to say a remnant, a tithe, a tithe to himself, Okay. 10%. When you look at the numbers in Revelation 7, they're based upon the number 12 and the number 10. 12,000 from one tribe, 12,000 from another tribe, and 1,000 is 10 times 10 times 10. So I do think that there's going to be a lot more Jews who God doesn't call, but there's definitely going to be, from every tribe, God is going to... What does it mean when... Ezekiel prophesied to the four winds to breathe breath into them. What does that mean? Four Gospels. And see, you have people like John Hagee. I don't like him. I don't, I don't like his theology. I don't like his eschatology. I don't like his idea of Israel. And you have a lot of other people. Jack Van Impey always thought this way, that God was going to restore Israel by bringing back animal sacrifices. Now, why would God, if he wanted to save Israel, why would God tell them to go back and do animal sacrifices when the lamb sacrifice has already been accomplished and fulfilled? That doesn't make sense to me. It does not make sense to me. Um, so he says in verse, um, 10, so I prophesied as they commanded me and then the breath came unto them and they lived and stood up their, uh, feet an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves. 
and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel and ye shall know. There he says it again. When I do this, then ye shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your eyes, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you. And I, I have been a huge proponent of the idea that there is going to be another outpouring of the Holy Spirit. One that fulfills all the uh, prophecies from Scripture from the book of Joel and other places. And this is it. What did Elisha want from Elijah? A double portion of the Spirit. And so here he says that. I'm going to fill you with the Holy Spirit because he breathed the breath into him. And um, put my Spirit in you and ye shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Then ye shall know that I the Lord have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Do you see all those? Then ye shall know. Then ye shall know. Why? Because right now Israel doesn't know. Turn very quickly, and I'll, I'll close with this. Turn to Jeremiah. That's before Ezekiel. Jeremiah chapter 31. I just happen to glance at verse 21 of Jeremiah 31, set thee up way marks and make thee high heaps. Um, out where Tracy lives in uh, Indiana, there's a lot of flat land out there and it's either corn or soybeans, corn or soybeans, corn or soybeans. And you don't see this too much around here, but out there, I, I liked this. Because you have all these old farm dirt roads and they're all in square grids. And usually at just about every corner, I don't know when they did this, but most of these, the corners of most of these lots where two roads intersected, there would be a, like a pillar set up that was right at the apex of the corner. And then a little bit of concrete going down this way and a little bit of concrete wall going down this way. In other words, there was a pillar and two 90 degree sections of concrete coming out. And they were old too. They had been there probably, I don't know, maybe 80 years, 100 years, something like that. You know what somebody did? Somebody went around and probably they already had something there. They just took up the old and put up new, but they put new way marks there. Those were landmarks. And those are legal, by the way. The survey team will come out, and if they see that landmark, that's where they're going to start doing their surveys from because that's been there. And since it's been there for so many years, that designates the edge of the property right there. And what did God tell in the law not to do with waymarks? Huh? No, not quite. He said, don't move them. Don't, yeah, don't move them. Why would somebody remove or move a waymark? Steal your land. A foot at a time. Okay? God said, don't do it. By the way, this Bible is waymarks. It's got waymarks all in it. Don't move any of them. Leave them right there. How would you like all of a sudden for all the Bible publishers to say, we redid the chapter and verse numberings in the Bible. So you're going to, I say, quote John 3, 16, but it's really Luke 12, 28 now. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, anyway, therefore, uh, verse 12, therefore prophecy and say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land. You shall know. I was, oh, I was supposed to read Jeremiah 31. I better move I, and then we'll do this and we'll go. Um, verse 27, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. Um, he says in, chapter, in verse 31, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them up out of the land of Egypt, 
which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. God later on says, uh, and they shall teach no man, every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sin no more. So when God resurrects, as he did in Ezekiel 31, as he showed Ezekiel what he was doing, this is the whole house of Israel right here. God, and if you keep reading Ezekiel 37, I encourage you to do this when you get home tonight. Finish the chapter out. Because you know what, you know what Ezekiel prophesied? That David was going to sit on the throne. Is it the Old Testament David? No, it's the new one. It's the real David. Who has put down all of the enemies because he won the battle, right? And he's going to be their king. And God told Ezekiel, take two sticks and bind them together. He said, okay, what does that mean? He said, well, the one stick is Samaria, which is the ten northern tribes. The other stick is Judah and Benjamin. And God said, you're going to bind them together and tie them together. So then instead of two different nations, now they're back to one again. I like it. I like it. God is in the revival business. After two days will he revive us, and the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. So Christ died, and on the third day he rose from the dead. 2,000 years ago, our Savior was born, he lived, and he died. 2,000 years later, at the beginning of the third day, there's going to be a resurrection. Amen. Amen.